Hi guys, today we're going to be talking about dementia and Alzheimer's disease. In this lesson, um, we're, we'll cover the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease, what Alzheimer's disease looks like, and most importantly, how to care for someone who suffers from Alzheimer's disease. So let's start by talking about dementia. Um, when we talk about dementia, we're talking about abnormal brain changes, which means that they're not associated with the aging process. It's not normal. Um, these changes are due to damage to brain cells, which uh, typically causes some kind of difficulty or inability to communicate. Now, oftentimes what we'll see in dementia patients is a slow decline in their cognitive abilities and cha uh, changes in their behavior and feelings. Now, remember, no two people are exactly alike, so this means not everyone will have the same symptoms. This is important to remember because the treatments and care that work on one person may not work on the other, and we have to understand that as healthcare providers. Now, the one thing that is the same across the board is that someone who suffers from dementia will ultimately become very forgetful um, and this is not the normal, I forgot what I was in the kitchen for, okay? It's going to become pretty significant as the disease progresses. Um, now, there are several types of dementia, so it's important to know what area um, the damage actually occurred first, because this is the type of dementia that the person has, like, say, frontal lobe, for instance. This is very similar to how we name cancer despite the spread. So it's also important to mention that dementia is also a progressive disease. There's no cure for it. However, with the right interventions, we can slow the progression and treat the symptoms. So we already said this is not a normal aging process issue, but most of the people suffering from dementia are elderly or have a family history of it. Um, Risky lifestyle behaviors and choices like alcoholism and drug use um, they can increase the risk of developing dementia as well. Now, please know there is a such thing as alcohol-induced dementia, and this actually does strike at an earlier age. Um, also, your personal medical history. Um, this has a lot to do with um, your risk for dementia as well. It has a very large bearing on it. If you've had head trauma or suffer from heart disease, your risk is greater. Why? because they can both cause damage or destruction to brain cells. Now, for instance, AIDS patients sometimes suffer from age-related dementia, which again can happen despite age. So let's talk Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is the most common form of dementia. Um, the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is what we call plaques and tangles in the brain. Um, as the brain starts to deteriorate, again, not a normal thing, this plaque is really just abnormal clumps of protein, um, and they start to build up in between nerve cells. Um, and then really think about uh, the plaque on your teeth and how your dentist uses that tool to scrape. It's kind of a horrible um, analogy, but that's really what it is. Now, also protein protein fiber bundles get tangled inside the nerve cells. And this is where you get your tangles from. Um, when I talk about plaques and tangles, when it comes to tangles in particular, I always um, think about my Christmas lights when I talk about them. It's a nice little bit of confusion there for you. Um, so here I have a picture of a healthy brain and then also an Alzheimer's brain. The big thing to remember is that with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease, the brain actually shrinks, which is what's happening here on this side. Um, you can see the differences between the two brains. The ventricles are huge on the healthy brain. Um, the hippocampus and the cerebral cortex are both really shrunken. If you take a look right here, these are your ventricles and this is your hippocampus in comparison to your hippocampus over here. So these are characteristics that we can't see until autopsy. And also just FYI, early onset Alzheimer's can start anywhere between ages 30 to 60. Um, late onset starts around the mid 60s. So remember, I just pointed out that the hippocampus shrinks. That's part of our brain that actually forms memory. So now you should be able to visualize why memory loss is such a big issue. So these are some of the risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't be the picture of perfect health and not end up with it. You're just more at risk if any of these relate to you. Now, remember, this is a form of dementia, and we discussed those risk factors earlier. So some factors overlap, others don't, but don't exclude them from the picture. So symptoms for Alzheimer's start small and can very easily be mistaken for aging. So when I assess my patient's memory, I usually ask them if they have trouble remembering things outside of going into the kitchen and forgetting where why they went there. Um, this kind of allows me to determine if there's cause for concern or if 
the forgetfulness is that's being reported is actually normal. Um, people suffering from dementia begin having problems performing daily, like your everyday tasks, like personal care, paying bills and cooking, for instance. Um, usually the skills that leave later are the personal care skills. They lose things, they'll sometimes accuse other people of stealing or moving them. Um, <clears throat> You'll notice that the person that you used to know isn't the person you know now because their behaviors and emotions change. This is a huge thing in dementia patients. Um, someone that used to be nice and sweet can now be rude and agitated or vice versa. Okay, The anxiety and aggravation behind losing your skills and memories honestly enough to make anybody's mood change. So we can understand where this comes from. I'd be angry or depressed too if I woke up one morning and couldn't remember how to put my clothes on. Okay, So also what you want to know is that Alzheimer's patients sleep habits usually change, um, sometimes very drastically because they don't really have a concept of time all the time, okay? Eventually, they'll lose control of their bowel and bladder as well. So essentially what we're seeing with Alzheimer's disease is a regression to infancy when you really think about it. So the truest diagnosis of Alzheimer's comes only after autopsy, but there are some things that we can find that we can do to, you know, find out if there are any changes um, or damage to the brain that may be consistent with dementia of some form. So here what we have is your CT scan, the MRI of the brain, and your PET scan. Um, these are all used to rule out other issues when memory impairment and cognitive issues start to occur. Um, outside of these tests, we can perform cognition exams like the mini mental statics exam, um, where we test the, function of, the functions of memory, uh, problem solving skills, and counting. Now, we use these exams to establish a baseline, so if that person's cognitive abilities do continue to decline, we'll see how far of a decline it's been and what supports we can put in place for it. So we said earlier that Alzheimer's and dementia are progressive diseases and they can't be reversed, but here we go. We're talking about medication as treatment, right? So what I want you to understand is that we're not treating the condition or trying to reverse it, but what we are doing with the medications is slowing the progression, uh, controlling the behaviors, and trying to target the symptoms. So depending on where in progression the patient is will help determine what kind of medication they receive. So you have um, cholinesterase inhibitors like Aricept or Exelon, you'll see more frequently. Um, those are used to treat mild to moderate cases. And then you have your NMDA antagonists like Namenda that will treat your moderate to severe cases. Now, what you'll also find is that a lot of antipsychotics and antidepressants are also used to kind of help treat the symptoms of your patients uh, as far as behaviors and the moods. Okay, so also to um, help control moods and behaviors is the psychosocial uh, approach. And this is where we use music and pet therapy as an alternative means to provide uh, the behavioral supports. So we're not trying to change the behavior because we do understand that we can't, but we do wanna minimize the uh, negative or the harmful ones. So safety and support are huge with this particular uh, population. Um, these, this is the most important thing that we can do is to keep our patients safe. So it's important to understand that the cognitive impairments and the loss of independence is very scary and frustrating for these patients. We want to make them as comfortable within themselves as we can, and we do that by avoiding their triggers and uh, avoiding confrontation when we can, providing consistent routines along with a calming environment. Now, these all help maintain some sense of normalcy, and they can decrease negative behaviors and outbursts. Um, redirection is actually necessary at times, particularly when we're looking at those negative behaviors we're trying to avoid. And we also like to try to provide some kind of security objects. Something as small as a blanket or a picture or a favorite book sometimes are all the memories uh, that an uh, Alzheimer's or dementia patient has. So as long as you know, the things that we take for granted sometimes have a great value to other people. And we have to take that into account. Um, this is no different for these patients. So if we know that there is that one thing that um, will provide them some sense of security and comfort and it's not harmful, then we do our best to provide it. Okay, so let's review some key points. Now, remember, dementia is an umbrella term um, for a group of diseases that occur from abnormal changes to the brain. It is not a normal part of aging, guys. Please remember that, okay? The hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are the plaques and tangles and the shrinkage of brain tissue, although these are only found in, truly found in autopsy for a real diagnosis. Um, medications. These are not uh, used for reversal of disease or for curative purposes. We are only trying to slow um, 
the progression and control behaviors and symptoms, okay? But despite the medication we use to treat, first and foremost, our priority is always to provide safety and support to our patients. Thanks for watching another nursing.com lesson. Click the link below in the description to watch thousands more lessons over on nursing.com. Also, be sure to hit the subscribe and the little bell to make sure you're reminded when new lessons come out. And if you wanna just keep watching more lessons, go ahead and click this video over here to continue learning. Like we always say here at nursing.com, happy nursing.